Now, what I'm going to do before I give you the message is I'm going to let Sebastian Selva share something with you. Now, uh, Sebastian's been a friend of mine for over 20 years now. And I believe it was in 2018, uh, he called me and said that in 2016, he had a visitation of the Lord and and that uh, he, the Lord told him that 2020 and 2021 were going to be challenging years. Well, folks, 2020 and 2021 was challenging years. Now, I'm not saying this just because Sebastian is a good friend of mine. I'm saying it because the Holy Spirit's leading me to say it. Uh, and he is credible as a seer prophet. And uh, they're seers and hearers. Um, some are mostly seers. Some are mostly hearers. Then there's people like myself who pro are both, you know, 50-50, if you will. So I'm going to ask Sebastian to share. Uh, well, I'll just let him sh uh, share uh, what he wants to share concerning uh, the Lord taking him up into the third heaven. You can introduce well, yourself. Uh, well, I will. This is Sebastian Selva, who lives in the Boston area. And like I say, we've been friends for over 20 years. And uh, when he tells me something, I know he's not adding to or taking away. He's telling you what God has shown him. So go ahead, Sebastian. Okay. Um, back in 2018, um, I had a visitation from the Lord Jesus, and he spoke to me and also showed me uh, about a year and a half into the future, and uh, everything came to pass. And he told me that he has a work for me. And I was a little bit disobedient towards the things of God. So in 2019, I I went to visit Terry and Carol in the church there, but I was ill. Uh, due to my disobedience, I allowed the enemy to affect my health. Uh, so I had a visitation shown uh, over a year and a half. Everything he told me came to pass. Now in November 18th and 19th of 2020, this was a surprise because I have had, uh, I've been taken into the spirit or a visitation and uh, visions. But this one here, it caught, I mean, I was surprised. I found myself in the third heaven, in a room, in a chamber, one of the chambers of the Lord Jesus. So I'm there, I'm standing, I know I'm somewhere, and I'm looking at my body. I can see my hands, I can see my legs, I can see my feet. And now I understand what the Apostle Paul said when he was taken up to the third heaven. He didn't know if, if he was in his body or out of the body. Because in the third heaven, I saw my body. But now I understand was my spiritual body on earth was my physical body. Then while standing there, I lift up my eyes. I saw the Lord Jesus. Then he approached me. We were face to face. So now I'm at the state of I'm at oh, first, right? As soon as he saw me, I saw him. He turned around and he spoke these words. He says, you have to be a servant to serve my people. The next word he said, you have to be obedient and humble. Then he comes, him and I are talking face to face encounter. And I could see his eyes. He could see my eyes. And I was at a state of awe. So I said to myself, let me, just be quiet. You're in front of the Almighty God, and 
You don't want to say or do anything foolish. So he started to talk about a lot of stuff. Now, I'm, this caught me off guard. A surprise visitation taken up to the third heaven. But this happened for two nights in a row. Two nights in a row that I had a face-to-face encounter with him. When he would talk, he would go on a certain topic. Then afterwards, he would look at me in my eyes to make sure that I understood. He went over a lot of stuff, mainly instructions, plus also corrections. But uh, let me get to the uh, main uh, a message. Uh, he went over a lot of topics. One of them that I need to share because, you know, uh, due to limited amount of time. He would talk, and afterwards he would give me a vision. I, I would be in the third heaven, a vision very similar to a PowerPoint. I would see it, and he would talk, and he so now I'm hearing and seeing. Now, uh, one of the things that he told me, I saw him and I saw a table and the table had a stack of papers. And he took his hands, he put it on the stack of paper. And I saw his hands, he put it on there, and these are the words he spoke. He says, concerning revelations, I will tell you whom to share it with and when. So now, uh, this is a hint. This is what I'm going to be using you for, revelations. And when I speak, I'll tell you whom to share it with and when. So now... Um, it'll take too long for the two days uh, third heaven uh, visitation but what so it's very important that he told me I will tell you whom to share it with and when and so I had uh now I am going to move from November 18th to 19, 2020. Then in uh, September 5th of 2021. This is a day before Rosh Hashanah. And those who know what, what it means, it means the head of the year is the Jewish New Year. The day before, again, unexpectedly, uh, I was taken into the spirit realm. This revelation really, uh, it was, got me, I mean, spiritually, I, I was, so I was taken into the spirit realm. Very similar to Ezekiel chapter 8, when God took his spirit, he went into the spirit realm. So when I was taken into the spirit realm, I heard these voices. From the Holy God stayed in this. This is what he said. I'm taking you to Europe. So now I am in the spirit realm. Very similar to Ezekiel when he was at his place. He went into the spirit realm and God took him to certain locations. While he was in the spirit going there. You know the Lord God will also speak. So I was taken in, into the spirit realm. Then in front of my eyes, in bold letters, I saw Europe, E-U-R-O-P-E, -E, all capital letters. And the Lord showed me a man in Europe. I saw this man. I saw his full body from his head to his feet. He was wearing like a suit. Very Trim, slim, well, well trimmed, not fat, overweight, a good body, well trimmed. But his face was bowed down. I was unable to view his full face, but I saw his body and his shape. His body shape was trim and in shape. 
now this, the scene changed. Now I'm seeing a large block of stone, a huge stone. And on top of the stone was flat. There's a huge block of stone. Then I saw letters being etched on that flat section up top. Then the voice of the Lord God spoke. He said, I will. He spoke. He will change laws and policies to be enforced. He will also be strongly involved in the financial industry. I sense the rock symbolize what he's going to do will be hard as a rock. And now the scene change in the spirit. I saw this man again. And the voice of the Lord God spoke. I know what this man is going to be doing. I know everything about him. Even he has his cell phone number, even his cell phone number. So now I'm here. I'm seeing this man in the spirit realm. Now I'm back seeing him. Now I'm seeing him, but I can't see his full face, just partial. Now the Lord is allowing me to hear this man speak. I heard few sentences. So I'm looking at this man. I'm hearing his voice. It was very smooth, was very calm, eloquent speaker, speaking a European language. I don't know European language, except I understand a little bit of Spanish and Portuguese. This, this was not Spanish and Portuguese. It was a European language. So I, I heard this. If, I, if God allows me to hear, if this man ever speaks and God allows me to hear his voice, because every one of us, we have a tone of voice and how we speak. And he was an excellent a communicator and well educated. Now the voice of the Lord God started again speaking concerning this man. This is this is what and the Lord God quoted a verse from Daniel. He says, This is what he said. He will speak words against the most high. He will continually harass the saints, the holy saints of the Most High. Will try to change the appointed times and laws. The holy saints will be handed over to him for time, times, and half a time. So now I was in a state of awe because I know this scripture is in reference to the Antichrist, to the beast, and to the little horn. And the Lord showing me him, and the Lord was indicating that he is alive. He's in Europe. He's coming out of Europe. He's there. And also, in the spirit, God, he also was telling me that he is allowing this man to do these things that, that is against the Most High and against his people. So this is not a surprise to him. God knows him already. God is allowing him to do his time and his role for Satan. And the encounter ended. So now I'm back. I left, I left the spirit realm. So now I'm back in my physical realm. And I'm just shocked and at awe. I'm, I'm saying, God, this is great revelation. I said, who am I to be getting this type of revelation and hearing your voice and being taken into the spirit realm? I was taken in the spirit realm to Europe. And so I'm back I'm back in my body. So I thought that what the Lord God, I, know, I knew it was in the book of Daniel. I thought it was... Uh, in Daniel chapter 11. So after 
I got back into my physical realm. I went and got my Bible. And I went to read chapter 11 of Daniel. I read the whole chapter, verse by verse. And I said, I can't find it. While thinking on where, on where it was, while in my physical realm, the Lord God, the voice of the voice of God spoke. It is in chapter seven. So I went to chapter seven and I found it. It was chapter seven, verse 25. Okay. So now I kept that. Then around, I believe is uh, either around uh, September 17th or 18th, while in prayer, I was praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. And out of my uh, prayer, the words, I was praying in the spirit and tongues. Terry Dunn's name came forth. Then about two, two or three days later, I'm in prayer again, and the Lord God spoke. What I shared with you, go share it with Terry Dunn. So now, because Jesus told me in uh, November the 18th, a concern and revelation, I will tell you whom to share it with and when. So God gave me the, the permission to share it with Terry, and I called Terry then after him and I spoke, and also Terry had his his okay encounter with the Lord. So it is um, right now apostles and prophets, God, those that are genuine and those that God is able to trust. There are apostles and prophets throughout His world, and due to we are entering into these challenging times in the time of the beast, the Antichrist, God's going to start speaking, giving revelations, visions, and taken to the third heaven or taken to spirit. It's not just me. There will be a lot of others, apostles and prophets that God's able to trust. And uh, I was shown a lot of things, and there are things that were shown to me that as God leads Terry Dunn and myself, we will okay, announce it because God wants to make sure that his church knows what's happening. And also it's very important that we all, st we all stay balanced with the apostolic, with the prophetic, with the evangelistic, with the pastoral and the teaching ministry. You know, I'm just a piece of the pie and we all got to do our part, whatever ministry God has, he wants, he wants you to do, do it. We got to be faithful and follow the Lord Jesus Christ and obey him. And um, as I do, I was shown a lot. I was shown the future. But again, as God leads Terry Dunn and I and Carol, you know, um, him and I, We'll talk about it, and also we'll see what God, what the Lord Jesus, he will allow to be shared. Okay, Terry Dunn, putting it back to you. Of course, it was the Lord giving them this information, but he pretty much preached my message. Um, I had the message before I knew a lot of this stuff, which is a confirmation to me also that um, God wants it taught. So uh, I'm going to preach this message anyway, because uh, <laughs> there are a few things that God has, has here that Sebastian, uh, he didn't give Sebastian to cover. But Sebastian, that was really a great, uh, great uh, witness. You really did good because uh, everything I'm going to give. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Everything I'm going to give confirms just what you said. Um, turn in your Bibles to Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3, and that's, uh, I think it's between, uh, uh, let's see, Joel and Obadiah, I believe. Yeah, Joel and Obadiah. Yeah, Amos chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you that 
because the Antichrist is alive and soon to rise to power, we need to know as much about him as possible so that we'll be able to recognize him when he appears on the world stage, and he will. Amos chapter 3, I'm just going to read two verses. Look at verse 6. It says, Shall a trumpet, now the word trumpet be shofar, shall a shofar be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Well, the answer to that is no. The people should be afraid. Why? Because it's a warning. It's a warning of evil. It's a warning of things are going to, uh, something's going to happen that they need to be warned about. So they should be afraid. Then it says, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord does not has not done it? And the answer, that's no. No, because God does it. See, uh, even uh, Sebastian mentioned that God is going to control everything that this person, the Antichrist, is going to, to do. Uh, God creates both good and evil. So God is the one that does it. Now look at verse 7. This is the main verse. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets or secret unto his servants, the prophets. In other words, God will share what he's about to do with his prophets and apostles, because most of them are, are prophets. In fact, all through apostles are prophets. But God is going to share what he's about to do with his prophets before he does it. That's what, why he shared this with uh, Sebastian. So the crux of what these two verses are saying is that God shares his innermost secrets with his prophets, which also includes apostles, because like I said, all true apostles are prophets. And the reason he does it is so they can warn his people of what he, who is the creator of both good and evil, is about to do. And what he's about to do at this very time, even as we speak, is to fulfill what's known as the Great Tribulation period. Now, for clarity's sake, so that there's no misunderstanding of what I just said, let me state it like this, and y'all pay attention because it is a warning. The Tribulation period has officially begun. And because it has officially begun... We need to be preparing ourselves for what's about to take place during the next three and a half to seven years, not only because the man of sin, as the Bible calls him, has been revealed as being alive on the planet, but because there's no such thing as a pre-trib rapture, which means that we, the saints, will be here for at least part of the tribulation period, if not all of it. And in certain previous messages, I've proven this to be biblically true, whether people choose to believe it or not. There are people that's not going to believe it. They're still thinking, oh, I'll fly away. I'm not going to be in. The Folks, get real. Read your Bible and let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what is going to happen. And I'm not talking to just y'all. I'm talking to whoever hears this later if it goes on YouTube or whatever. 1 Corinthians 15.52 says, We'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, not the first trump, the last trump. The last trump will be blown right before the Lord returns to set up his millennial kingdom and not prior to that time, which means that the church as a whole needs to be prepared for the difficult days that lie ahead instead of falsely thinking that they'll be snatched off the earth by a pre-trib rapture as the means by which you escape what Jesus described in Matthew chapter 24 as having to be fulfilled before he could return. Let me explain to you, this isn't in my notes, Pre-trib rapture was brought into the church for this purpose. It puts everybody at ease. And if they come to church, it's going to be peaceful. If they come to church, we can make them feel good, and they'll come back. Kyle could probably shed more light on this than, than me, and if you need to contact Kyle, do that, and, and he will. But it, it was, I think, a 15-year-old uh, teenage girl had a 
dream and he dreamed of the this pre-trib rapture and she told her pastor and anyway it spread into the church system and they used it to keep people in their church let me explain something to you i'll preach a, a, a larger message on it later but in the old testament when the children of israel were under the bondage of the egyptians Egypt represented the world. Did he pull out the children of Israel before he put all them plagues on them? No. So what would give us the idea to think we're extra special? He's going to pull us out before he does all these things in the tribulation period. That's foolishness. It's pride. It's ignorance. And the church needs to wake up to the fact, and they will. They'll wake up to the fact that, wait a minute, something's happening here that wasn't supposed to happen in our doctrine. And they'll start reading the Bible and understanding, hopefully, more of what's happening. Matthew 24, 34 says it like this. Truly I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. The things he's talking about as having to be fulfilled are listed not only in Matthew chapter 24, but the synoptic chapters of Mark 13 and Luke 21 as well. And the generation that he's referring to that shall not pass away is the generation of today. The generation that saw Israel become a nation in 1948. I was born in 47. A lot of y'all are that generation. So the church has got to get real and understand what the Holy Spirit says the Bible means. Stop listening to all this church doctrine and all this junk that's been passed down for centuries because it's a feel-good gospel. I mean, we do deliverance, and when the Lord told me to start doing deliverance in our church, he, he warned me, your church is going to split. They ain't going to accept this, but he's telling me to do it. If he tells me, I work for him. We'll probably have a small church for the remainder of my life till the Lord comes. It's okay with me because when I stand face to face with him, I can say, I did do deliverance, Lord. <laughs> have a little mercy on me here. <laughs> so with that said, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And what I'm going to do, this message isn't very long, but what I'm going to do for the remainder of the, uh, of the message is to do a quick study of this person the Bible calls the Antichrist, also known as the beast or the first beast, because there's no doubt that he's presently alive on the earth and about to rise to power. Now, a lot of the scriptures I'll, I'll be reading and, and giving to you, uh, Sebastian covered them, and that's fine. You need to hear them more than once. Uh, so look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's just start at verse 1. Now, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Thessalonica. And what the church of today has to understand is that when Apostle Paul or any or, or even Jesus was talking to the churches that would have been in the future when he walked the earth, when they talk to this specific church, they're talking to us because we're all one church. We're all one body. It doesn't matter what generation you're in. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you're part of the church, the ecclesia. So he's talking to us. See, a lot of churches read this stuff like it's history. It's not history. It's to us in real time. So look at verse uh, 1. It says, now we beseech you. That means we beg you. So now we beg you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Our gathering together unto him. He's talking about the rapture. But he's talking about the rapture during the tribulation period because he goes on to say some things that, that uh, will uh, be a clue that he's talking about a rapture during the tribulation period. Look at verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind. All right, when are you going to be shaken in mind? During the tribulation period. Or be troubled. When are you going to be troubled? During the tribulation period, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. What he's saying is we're going to tell you the truth. We'll send you the letter, but don't worry about it. It's going to happen. 
Just accept it and stay close to God. Look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Now, there's already a falling away. When you just study the churches, they have fallen away from the true word of God. They're into what their doctrine says. They're into what the hierarchy of their denomination says. There's already that falling away. But there's even a more of a falling away. Let me explain it to you. About two weeks ago, the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, which is one to two billion people on the planet, the Pope sanctioned a worldwide global religion called Chrislam. What Chrislam is, is a combination of Christianity and Islam. The Bible teaches no such thing. That is definitely a falling away. What that is, is the beginning of us seeing who the apostate church is. And I won't pick on the Catholics, because we got a lot of them that come out of the Catholic church and are seeing the truth. Verse 4, who opposes, this would be the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, that would be the temple in Jerusalem, showing himself that he is God. In other words, he's going to set himself up to be a God. That would be easy to recognize if we're still here. That might happen in the last part of the tribulation, and the Lord may have raptured us off. Because remember, he does say that he has to shorten it, because if he didn't, even the elect who are here in, during the tribulation period would be deceived. Look at verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. So this is not the first time he's told them. He's been warning them numerous times. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He's going to tell us what's holding back the Antichrist until his time comes to come upon the world stage. Verse 7 tells us that. For the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, that in one application, that's probably of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit holds sin and iniquity back. He's, the Holy Spirit is God's, uh, uh, the, the part of the Trinity that God uses, the Godhead uses, to hold back uh, the Antichrist. So it appears he's going to be removed so that the Antichrist can rise to power. Now, I want to say this about that. All the churches and all the Christians, and I'm not saying they're not saved, I'll call them Christians, though only the Lord knows, but all the Christians that are not spirit-filled will suddenly find themselves without the Holy Spirit. He won't be anywhere except in those who are spirit-filled. Do you understand now the power of Acts 1.8 where it says you should receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Ghost? That's why I've always taught you need it. See, there's, there's, we have people in our family I won't mention their names. My own personal thing is, oh, I got all the Holy Spirit I need. No, you don't. You're not infilled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. You need it. Oh, no, I got all I need. That is a doctrine of devils, folks. Look at verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That would be like in Revelation, I think, chapter 19, you know, where Jesus comes riding back on the white horse and the sword comes out of his mouth and he destroys his enemies. That's what it's referring to. Even him, the Antichrist, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. In other words, even Jesus is more powerful than the Antichrist, the false prophet, the beast, Satan himself. 
So Jesus is going to destroy even the Antichrist is what it's talking about. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, I want you to see this because a lot of churches teach us God is love. Well, he is love, but that's all they teach. God is love. They teach God is merciful. He is merciful, but that's all they teach. They don't know the many personalities of God, uh, for lack of a better term. Now, nobody knows all of them, of course, but there's a side to God that he's going to be the judge. He's merciful. He's a God of love. But even Jesus said himself, he says, fear not him who can uh, kill the body, but fear him who can cast your soul into hell. Who's that? That's God. God's the only one who can cast you into hell. Satan can't cast you into hell. Satan can uh, cause you to not accept the truth to where you will be cast into hell, but it's God that does the casting into hell. That's a side of God the church doesn't teach. Why? The church is split. Why? The church won't grow. We got to have the church growing because if the church ain't growing, we don't look successful. That's man's doctrine. How many, how many in Jesus' church when he walked the earth? Twelve. <laughs> that ought to tell you something. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. What God will do is if you want sin and iniquity, he'll give it to you. Take it. Run with it. He may even turn you over to be a reprobate, a reprobate mind. That's what God will do. That's how serious he is about this following Christ or not following Christ. That they all might be damned. Did you get that? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unforgiveness. In other words, God will turn them over to their evilness, so they'll be damned. It's called a strong delusion. Delusion. God will give them that strong delusion, so they'll be damned. Now, I asked the Holy Spirit, like, you know, because there's a scripture that says that uh, God wishes that none should perish. It's because when they stand in the judgment, they will know they deserve the damnation that they are going to receive. So God, if they want it, God turns it over to it. So there's no question about it in the judgment. So in essence, what this passage of scripture is saying is that during the time of the great tribulation, after the Antichrist has been allowed by the Holy Spirit to rise to power, God will start what Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 25 as the dividing of the sheep from the goats, with the goats being those who take the mark of the beast and follow the Antichrist into eternal damnation, while those whom the book of Revelation describes as he that overcometh, which is a second in a secondary application, applies to those who overcome the tribulation period by not taking the mark of the beast, they'll go into eternity to forever be with the Lord. Now, before closing, I want to give you some isolated scriptures, and Brother Sebastian mentioned some of them. But in case you didn't have a pen and write it down, you can get them again. But I'm going to give you some isolated scriptures that describe the Antichrist and some of the things he'll be doing once he makes his global appearance. Now, for time's sake, rather than study the whole book of Daniel, which I might do at a later time, but if the Lord leads, but for time's sake, you can just write these scriptures down and read them on your own time, along with Revelation chapter 13, which I omitted from this message because we studied it a few weeks ago in part six of my Truth About the Book of Revelation series. Daniel 7, verse 8, that's the first scripture. It says that he, the Antichrist, will be a great orator and public speaker, which no doubt will play a major role in his deceitfulness. 
See, he'll get in as a great speaker, great orator. Brother Sebastian covered that. The Lord spoke that to him specifically. And this is the scripture that the Lord uh, wanted Brother Sebastian to find specifically, Daniel 7.25. It says he'll use his eloquent, eloquent speaking ability to speak against the Most High. It also says he'll wear out the saints and try to change the law and the times of the holy days, which means that probably during the second half of the tribulation period, which would be the last three and a half years of his reign, he'll war against the saints, and he'll even overpower many of them. He'll attempt to change the times and dates of the Jewish feasts, and he'll try to change the law of Moses. He'll be easy to recognize if we're still on the earth then. Daniel 9.27 says, The Antichrist will make a covenant with other nations for seven years, but at the start of the second three and a half years, which is halfway uh, into his seven-year reign, he'll break the covenant and stop the sacrifices that the Jews will have reinstated, followed by his act of desecrating the temple in Jerusalem, which is the abomination of desolation that Daniel saw and that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, verse 15. Daniel 11, verse 21 says, he'll start his reign peaceably, peaceably, and he'll gain control of his earthy, earthly kingdom through, and I'm going to read you what the Amplified ver, uh, Version says, he'll uh, gain control of his earthly kingdom through flattery, intrigue, and cunning, hypocritical conduct. You can read it in King James, and you won't get all that, but you'll get some of it. Daniel 11, verses 36 and 37 says that the Antichrist will magnify himself above every god, which is the true God, including the true God, and the God of his fathers. Now, I don't know if the God of his fathers is a different God or not than Yahweh, but he'll set himself up and he'll claim to be himself God. Daniel eleven forty four says he'll go forth with great fury and utterly destroy many, many people, Christians included, as he wars against the nations of the world. Now, for a closing scripture, I want to leave you with a couple of verses that I hope will comfort you with the fact that God, because he's totally sovereign, is in control of everything that will take place during the tribulation period. That's important to know. And that there will be a rapture of the church, and by that I mean the true remnant church. It's just not going to be pre-trib rapture as many in Christendom today have erroneously taught. I could even say falsely taught, but some of them really, they're just in error. And they can correct that error. The Lord says they will correct that error as, <laughs> as this goes on further into the tribulation period. Jesus in John 16, verse 33 said, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And my second scripture of comfort is 1 Thessalonians 4.17 which says, then we which are alive and remain, and the secondary application of the word remain refers to those who are on the earth during the time of the tribulation period. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That would be those who've gone on before us. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him the Lord. Close your Bibles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for as always, your word is truth. 
We also thank you, Father God, for your precious Holy Spirit, who is our spiritual guide and an instructor, especially in these last days when the instruction that comes directly from your throne room will be desperately needed. For it's the means by which we'll be able to survive the final days until our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, returns. And in his name and all in agreement said, Amen.